right today, I want to cover another aspect of understanding who we are individually. Understanding what makes us who and what we are and makes us different from everybody around us. Now you might ask, why is that important? It's very, very important for many reasons. One of them is to ensure that we are able to achieve our absolute best in all that we do, so that each of you can become absolutely excellent as a student to start with, and then when you go out on your placement year, when you go out after finishing here and graduating with a great degree, you become excellent employees. It provides you with an understanding of yourself that will allow you to illustrate your excellence when you make job applications. Because, as I said last week, by the time you finished here, your technical skills should be on a par with everybody else around you. And that's not actually ultimately very helpful in getting your job application from the in heap into that must interview heap, rather than the, oh dear, out round disposal basket. So you need to be thinking about what makes you special, that can make you able to contribute really well in your job because that's what the employers are looking for on your job application and in your interview. Not what they can do for you, but what you can do for them. And to do that you need to understand yourself really, really well. And some of the things I'm going to go through today are going to help you understand some of those things that are going to make you different. And to revel and really enjoy your individuality and your own excellence. I want to look at it in terms of how it affects your career choices. The things that you're really great at, your innate ability to be brilliant. Because actually we all have the ability to be brilliant in a particular area. And I want you to be able to find out what your area of brilliance really is. It will also help you in your interpersonal relationships. Now, as a lecturer, looking at you as students and as future employees, that's the area I'm actually concentrating on. But many of you will find what we're going to cover today very, very interesting in your own personal, private relationships. It will give you some insights into how we are, who we are, and how that affects how we relate to others around us. Now, businesses, education, don't really take on the right to affect your interpersonal relationships. It's a byproduct of thinking about what I'm talking about in relation to being a good student, being a good employee. So these are the two consequences I want to concentrate on today. It's based on an amazing book which was published about 12, 13, 14 years ago. Well, 14 years ago. By a married couple, um, Peas and Peas. With a very, very provocative title, Why Men Don't Listen. Yeah, well, we think we know about, a bit about that as blokes. And sometimes we as blokes look at women and think, they can't read maps, they don't understand maps at all. Except that's not actually quite true. But they wanted to make a point, and of course can only be written and published by a married couple, or man and a, wife, uh, a woman working together. It couldn't have been written by a man, or by a woman alone. It, it's success in the things I'm going to show you in the next 25, 35 minutes or whatever, is because it has the insights from a man and a woman working together, writing from their own perspective as a man, as a woman. It's kind of a variation on the men are from Mars, women are from Venus and that sort of thing. It, the power of this book, and there's a copy I think in the library, at least one, 
You can get it for a couple of quid on Amazon without any difficulty if you want to follow it up. The power of this book is that it is based on physiological evidence, by and large. Many, many brain scans of men and women over the 1990s or thereabouts. They're looking at the stereotypes. The males at one end, the females at the other end, the extreme versions of each. And the reason we do this in research, is looking at the extremes, is because it's easy to characterize those. We see it in man, um, human uh, resource management uh, work as well, looking at uh, managing change. The theories of different styles of management, they're always po posed as one or the other, the bureaucratic Weber type of style, or the um, Taylor's type of approach of time and motion and all of the scientific approach to management. What we discover is that in reality, there are very, very few organizations at either end of the spectrum, in the same way as there are very, very few men who are hard, hard, purely male. And there are very, very few women at the far end who are very, very, very feminine. We are all in a distribution in the middle. So they start off at the extremes, the two stereotypes. The one, men can't listen, the other, women can't read maps. But then they look a bit about the spectrum, the way we're not out there, but we're somewhere in the middle. Now this has very interesting consequences on career choice, for example. It also has enormous consequences in how we communicate. The sort of things you've been doing over the last four or five weeks while you've developed your article. Thinking about communicating that amazing thing that you've researched in those four topic areas, or one of those four topic areas, that has the capability to change society. And then, how do we choose the words? How do we think about our audience? the people reading our article, the people who are sitting up there, like you guys, listening to me. So four important issues here. It is not saying all women are like that and all men are like that. No, it's saying those are the extremes that help us to understand what they are. And then we can see for ourselves individually how much of that we have and how much of that, because many, many men have a lot of feminine attributes, and many women have a lot of male attributes. And that, again, has consequences both on ourselves individually and on how this dialogue between each other works. Because we may not, even if we have a purely male audience, and we're a male or a female presenter, we can't assume that all of the audience is of one type. They are spread out. And that changes the way we think about communicating, the way we look at faces even, to see how you are responding. It starts with a lovely comment from Joan Rivers. And yesterday or the day before, a diamond mining company in Botswana found the second largest diamond that was ever found. 1,111 carats weight of, got, of diamond. Probably worth more on sale than that little company is currently valued at. They look at a whole series of areas, starting off with the mapping and understanding of spatial awareness. The polarities, extreme female, extreme male, are quite interesting. <coughs> Little test, folks. Which of A, B, C, D is actually the cube you can create by folding that little thing on the left into a cube? Got two or three minutes to think about it, and then put your hands up when you've got an idea of the answer. How 
many have got an answer? Okay, uh, right. A. Who's got A? Who's got B? C? D? All above. Only one. If you look at the arrow, it's pointing to the junction between the X and the dot, and there's only one which does that. That's A. <coughs> Here's another version. Suggest there's actually only one that actually does it. Sorry? D or C? Hands up, C. D? Why D? What is it about the pattern that says it's D? What is it about the pattern of, that makes it C? Points away from the circle and the X, correct, yeah. Then there's one that's quite interesting, and I might even have to check up the answer myself. <coughs> it's used, or has been used by air traffic controller uh, tests, aptitude tests, to see whether you can handle spatial perception. So you've got an answer, you've got four answers, which could be A, B, C, or D, or none, row by row. Row one. B, 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 B. Right. Row two. Now you've got to twist it around in your mind a little bit. Because you're looking at different sides. Row three. And row four. Okay, let's go and have a look at the answers. As I have a little um, right. Test one with A. Test two was C. Most of you got those. So, being truthful, how many got all of those tests right? Oh, we'll go off and then apply to the National Air Traffic Control people. You've got the right sort of spatial awareness. You can move things in your head. How many got all of them wrong? Well done, most of you. Well, sorry, not well done that you got it all wrong, <coughs> or well done that all of you got some of them right.
next thing is that uh, Barbara and Alan Pease looked at back in 2000 odd was types of careers and in terms of teaching university or school the, the gender split or proportions in the various subject areas. Now, this is slightly complicated by the fact that as well as what they're trying to understand is the innate abilities of our brains to cope with the different types of subject, there's also the problem of role models. And if we look at some areas um, in sports, you know, we don't have the role models that actually allow the different genders to always do the things they want to do. I was listening to a little program last night about jazz players. And it was a little discussion about five, ten minutes long with three very great leading female jazz players. And they were saying one of the biggest problems about getting women into jazz is not that they can't do it, but they don't see people, women out there being successful. If you think back over the last 50 years, the great jazz players are almost all male, that is the instrumental players, are almost all male, and they're very often from the USA, and they're very often black. Many, many exceptions, but its role models may also be the problem. So it's a bit, a bit complicated, but this gives a general sort of perspective that there are some careers, some subjects, where there seem to be far fewer women involved than men and vice versa. Physics is one of the particularly extreme varieties, where well, there's maths as well. Now, they've got physics and information technology, and that's one that we have a problem here. If we look at some of our mod mod uh, programs in computing, there are remarkably few <coughs> females involved. All sorts of reasons. However, they make the point about spatial awareness and spatial perception in some of these areas. We'll see some other examples in a little bit. The consequences lead to this in terms of career choice. Ninety-four percent air traffic controllers. I mean, I was actually very lucky. A few years ago, I was sitting outside um, having a cigar at an airport in, uh, I think it was Toronto, and a lady was sitting there smoking as well. And it turned out she was one of the very, very few air traffic control female air traffic controllers in the world. They do happen. Again, what they're talking about here is trying to connect spatial awareness and ability with some of these types of career choices. How many of you follow Formula One? And so you're well aware that Susie Wolf, who was the first uh, female to move into Formula One in a couple of decades, has now decided to retire because she sees there is no chance of her becoming even the um, reserve driver for Williams, let alone a test driver, or the main drivers. She had two or three outings in pra free practice one this year, but she's not going to make any progress. Now, the interesting thing is that in Formula One and other such um, types of racing, whether it's uh, um, lower levels of, for, of the single car racing, or the um, saloon car type racing, there are still remarkably few women. However, in drag racing in the States, about 10% of the very, very, very best drivers are women. And it turns out that one of the issues is that in most motor racing, you're going around and around, you're chasing each other, you've got to judge distances very tightly, all sorts of things. Whereas in formula, in drag racing, you are, there's just two of you, 
And when the lights go out on the Christmas tree, you put your foot down hard, the mechanisms sort out acceleration and so on, and you go absolutely hell for leather until you go past the end and then you slow down. There's no real spatial awareness required other than just go like the clappers and go straight and control it when it tries to go a little bit twitchy. That's the point that they would be making here. And we can see the history of Formula One racing drive, female racing drivers, and there are remarkably few. So, spatial awareness is kind of different, perhaps. There's an interesting point in the next chapter, and each chapter is prefaced by a beautiful, lovely cartoon. And here is a family on their holiday, and the driver is the dad, and he does not want to admit that he's lost. Because we all know, as men, that we understand maps and we understand driving and directions and so on, so we can't possibly get lost, so we won't ask for help. Hence, that lovely little sign that the children are hanging out to the passing policeman, help, we're lost, but our dad won't stop for directions. The joke is on us guys here. Many, many men look at a two-dimensional map and create the three-dimensional picture in our head of where we're trying to go. Often, males, the male stereotype, and many, many men, and some women as well, can take verbal directions and create that 3D map in our head so we don't get lost. And we certainly don't want to admit to it, ever, that we can get lost. However, the next stage that uh, Brian Alpes look at is this particular topic. Now, the parallel parking topic, which they record here in 2001, was also discussed by a female, a leading female psychologist from America in about 1980, 1985. Look at the caption. This is now from the female perspective. The, stuff, the work they present is quite interesting. They suggest that in, on average, women find it easier to take a 3D map and use that because it's all been converted into something they can see in their head. The other thing is to think about, and this is a question to you, you ladies, if you're in a car and you are navigating for somebody, whether it's a, fi a, a female friend or a male friend, how often do you turn your map around so that it's pointing in the right direction? I know lots who do, I know some who don't. It has to do with that little test we, were taught, we started off with about being able to take that mental map or that mental image of that cube you created and twist it around in your head without having to do it on the paper in front of you. This is a sort of map that they claim is more effective for women and girls, for the average woman or girl. We, or they claim also from the evidence of the research they've done, that men typically find it easier to create this map in their head from the 2D map than from using something like this. This is useful to us, great, but we don't actually need it so much. The next bit is really interesting. This is based on CAT and MRI type scanning of brains of people in the CAT scanner, the MRI scanner, to see which bits of the brain they're using <coughs> while they're doing things. Now, we've all seen this at some, at some time or other, and you can always pick up these um, slides and have a look at them. <coughs> we all have 
laughs at these, we have a laugh at each other as males or as females, at males, at females. But it makes a point in a rather unscientific fashion about how we each perceive the other gender as thinking. However, we also have, from many years of writing, many years of presenting this information, going back hundreds of years, ideas about what happens in which half of the brain. The logical, mathematical side in the left hemisphere, and the right hemisphere, you know, the creative, artistic things. And there is some degree of truth in this sort of depiction. It's not completely right, we'll see some more in a minute. One of the most interesting things that came out of some research back in the 1980s and was encapsulated in a really interesting BBC documentary, a series they had, um, this was just one of them, was about how different types of written language affect how the workload is balanced between the two hemispheres. And it was an observation that, back when they did this, back in the mid-80s, there was, it was very interesting to find that people or races which had a, um, a phonetic type of alphabet like we have in English and in all of our Western languages, in the Arabic languages, we all find it fairly easy to be inventors, we can read and so on and so forth. And back then, the number of patents for new inventions was predominantly from nations which had phonetic languages. In contrast to uh, nations in the Far East who have ideographic languages like kanji and Mandarin, the Chinese language set, and one of the three languages that the Japanese use. And they made the observation based on some interviews that when people from the ideographic written language uh, nations tried to read phonetic languages, they got headaches quite easily. It was very difficult because they <coughs> spread their language, written language processing across both hemispheres, whereas we in the West, with phonetic alphabets, tend to sp split the job um, into the sound processing in the right-hand side and push it across, once we've got the language, into our right hemi left hemisphere to come up with the understanding of the sense, whereas it didn't work quite like that with ideographic languages. So this is common knowledge. It turns out when we actually do MRI scanning, it's not quite as simple as that. So there's a question at an academic level, why do we believe something like that just because it's been presented to us time and time and time and time again? It was presented to me when I was doing experimental psychology in my first year at university back in 1971. So why do we believe things that just because they're presented to us time and time again? Why don't we go and do some research to find out the real truth? Well, back then they didn't have MRI scanners, so it's kind of difficult to see which bits of the brain lit up when we were doing different types of tasks. A second question is, does it matter? Well, of course it does, because if we're going to think about the scientific way of doing things, we actually need to understand, the, and f well, find out, and then understand the objective reality. And what are the consequences if we believe things like this? Well, if we believe what is not true, it kind of hampers us in developing true understanding, whether it's about the way computers work, wh whether it's about the sort of impact that our discoveries are having on society, such as you've been researching. So, lots and lots of MRI scans have been done, and they've been consolidated into various, sort of, you might say, stereotypes. And as you can see here, back in 1999, it became very, very apparent that the way that the average man, the average woman, process spatial awareness is fundamentally different. 
Just look at the difference between the left and the right. The black areas are the bits of the brain that are lighting up, that are actually consuming a lot of oxygen, <coughs> implying effort, while an activity, while they're processing location um, issues. Speech. Look at how much of the brain is involved in processing and understanding and all the other things that's going on in the female brain compared with us poor blokes who've hardly got any aspects of the brain active. What does that mean in terms of communication? We're seeing a lot of reports at the moment about the need to have more females at high levels, at high executive and director levels in businesses. Because they communicate, both listening and talking, in very, very different ways to us poor blokes. So, relatively little activity in a man's brain in terms of this communication activity. There's another way you can look at that though. Yeah? That a man can get his point across in less words. <laughs> that had actually struck me. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean you could reverse the argument and say, well the and you could actually go back to this one. You could actually pose oh, Propose the argument, actually women are vastly more efficient at handling spatial ability. There's lots of interesting questions that come out of this, guys and ladies. However, by and large, the work that's been done so far suggests that, yeah, it's not a matter of inefficiency that's causing the huge amount of the male brain to light up here, but that they are doing much more in terms of managing and manipulating and handling spatial awareness here and the females in concentrating on the task at hand, in really getting a lot of stuff going to really help them to understand what's being said, what needs to be said. Emoting, emotional understanding as well. So there's lots of things going on here and I think the case really is the dark areas suggest not inefficiency and therefore lots of processing required, but enormous amounts of uh, processing being devoted to being really very, very good at doing the task. Another one, where things are happening emotionally are going on. Two largest blocks in the right hand hemisphere for the men, but much more activity spread across the whole of the brain for women. And we all know, well we all think we know, that women are much better at emotional intelligence, they're much more able to feel how the person they're talking to is feeling. They understand emotional communication is the point being made here, perhaps. A test. What do you see in that picture? How many can see two totally different interpretations? How many can see just one? Of those who can see just one, who can see an ugly old witch-like hag? How many of you who can see just one can see the very beautiful young lady? And how many can flip at will between the two pictures. Okay. Now, what do you see there? Pardon? Is there anything wrong with the, to you with the shape that has been drawn there? Pardon? Yes. Is there anything wrong with the desktop? 
No, it seems to get wider at the back, doesn't it? Yeah. And yet, it is actually drawn as a perfect trapezium. The two sides are actually parallel if you actually get it flat and measure them. Because we are interpreting spatial awareness as a 3D object which should get narrower as it gets further away from us. <coughs> and what do you see there? How many see some random black and white shapes? How many see a word? And the word is? Fly. Now, what's interesting here, folks, is not that you fail if you can't see the word fly. What's important is understanding what what that means about the way we see things. There is no winner, there is no loser in any of these little questions. They are to give us insights into how our own individual brain works. The next chapter introduced by this beautiful, I mean I find it absolutely fabulous, this uh, lovely little cartoon. I trust you can all read it. Now, whether or not it's true, do we all feel that we can actually kind of associate with those two different perspectives as being fairly typical of how we respond in emotional types of situations? Now, yeah, we've got that. It's hilarious and has a little bit of relationship to the truth. This, however, is a bit more important. I mean, you know, we, we talk about reading um, emotion, reading faces, and understanding how our listeners are reacting to what we're saying. And I look up and last week I noticed one or two, oi! I noticed one or two who kind of maybe switched off or at least, well, it was a little bit more than the, the sort of deadpan that tends to happen. It was kind of asleep, so maybe I'd lost it there. But what is important is, yeah, as humans, we do watch the body language of those people around us who we're having discussions with. And now this gives us an interesting clue that if we are expecting lots of reaction, well, we'll probably get it more <laughs> from those people who have some female traits in their, as we might put it here, in their behavior, than those who have the more extreme male deadpan type of effects. That causes a lot of confusion as to are people listening to us, are they engaging with what we're talking about, and so on. So in this model, the male reaction can be a problem for those, whether they're female or male, who are expecting a lot of facial changes, a lot of body language. <coughs> It boils down to typically, but not exclusively,
this particular point. Males tend to be more impassive, females much, much more expressive. So maybe that says I'm kind of a bit more female uh, attributes with body language, talking with my arms, um, and a lot of intonation and so on. But hey, that's me. Think about it for yourself. Because it causes confusion potentially. Do we have the same brain or do we have different? And there's been a lot of work, a lot of uh, research, a lot of writing that says, yes, we have different brains, yes, we have the same brain. Some, uh, for a variety of reasons, perspectives. Now, what I want you to do after this, this evening, there is an, a questionnaire with 30 questions. I want you to go through that questionnaire yourself and then score it. Because it will help you to begin to understand a little bit about where in the male-female space you individually actually live. And one interesting point here, folks, because there are huge consequences in our communication and in all sorts of other ways, is to work out where we live on that spectrum. And just to give you an inclination, just to give you a little sort of summary of how important it is and what its implications are, a, couple of, a few years ago when I did this lecture in another context, after it had happened, I went back up to my office, not in fifth floor where I am now, but somewhere else, and I found two of the students who had just been in that uh, lecture and they were having an interesting discussion. There's a big tall guy and a little uh, female student about that high. And she had come out in around about 150, 160, 170, right in the middle of the spectrum. And the big tall guy was like, oh, that shows you a butch. And she said, I'm not! Fortunately, I was there just at the right time. Because I was able to reassure her that because she was right in the middle, she had an unbelievable gift. The gift was she could understand really well, she could communicate really, really well with both males and females. A gift that is very, very rare. But a stunning gift to have. So do the test, find out where you are, and then decide it. Now, there are one or two, Oi! we haven't finished yet, we've got another five minutes really, in principle. Don't need to be so enthusiastic to get out. Here is another interesting comparison. How do we ask, to get, people to have things done. Do we drop sort of hints or do we go outright and say I would like? Look at this example here. Who would say to their partner as they were getting up, oh can you go and make me an omelette? I'm just looking for loving an omelette. And how many and who and who would say as they get up, not go and make me one, but would you like to would you like an omelette for breakfast? Who would say that? Another clue to how we communicate. Are we direct or do we skirt around the edges with sort of hints and tips? And if, we, if two people in a conversation if two people in a conversation come from those two different from what each of those op uh, op opposite approaches, there is going to be confusion. Now, have a look at the rest of the last two or three slides uh, later on, and then think about what the consequences are on the way we each behave, the way we listen, the way we do things, the way we communicate, and see how that 
will help you to become more understanding of those around us as we try to achieve our goals and our objectives. Thanks very much, folks. Thank <laughs> you.